The question a lot of people are asking this morning is, when can you apply for emergency use authorization in the United States? Can you go with the data you've got thus far, or do you have to wait uh, for the further study that is being conducted stateside? No, it's a great question. And uh, what we've got are three efficacy trials that are in process right now. We've got the one in South Africa, the 4,500 people that is complete. We've got the one that we reported on today, or yesterday as well, and 15,000 people in the UK. That, that study, it turns out, is an interim study. It got great results. We've got 96% efficacy against the COVID-19 uh, strain that circulates the globe. And they have a uh, mutant strain there called uh, uh, the UK mutant uh, and single mutant. And we got 86% efficacy there. So even, even against a um, drifted strain, we got good data. We're expecting, so that trial has to, that's an interim data. We have to complete the trial, which means we have to, another two or three weeks, collect enough cases to get past 100 cases. And we'll take um, those data and use those data to file for regulatory approval in the UK through the MHRA. And what we're hoping, and we're talking with the, we're talking with the FDA, we're talking with MHRA in UK, we're talking with EMA in Europe, and we're hoping that we can take that data pack, package to the FDA and have them evaluate our vaccine based upon the UK data while we're running a phase three trial in the US. And the US trial is running uh, very well. We're, we're targeting 30,000 people. Uh, we started a month ago and we've gotten 16,500 people as of yesterday. And we expect to finish accruing that trial by the uh, beginning or middle of February. And uh, then we'll count cases and, and get data, but, it'll, but it will pace uh, the UK data. And, and so uh, what we're hoping is, is that while we're finishing up that trial, yeah. we can go to the FDA and um, and get asked for EUA approval. Stan, and, and you, have yeah. you talked to the FDA? Are they, are, are they cool with that timeline or would they be on board with that? We are talking to them and, and there's, there, we are, we don't have a definitive uh, answer yet. They're, they're very familiar with what we're doing. And so then actually, to be honest, uh, all of the agencies uh, have been very uh, informative and flexible, and you know it's all, all it's all data driven. And we just got our data uh, yesterday, and so so we will um, uh, have uh, continued conversations with with all the agencies. Stan, as you currently see things, when do you think the first Novavax shots will go into somebody's arm, and where do you think that will be? I think the first shot will be in the UK. I think that the first approval will be in the UK, and I think the the it will go into somebody's arm, uh, hopefully in early April. Um, can we talk a little bit about the data that you know so far? Uh, what was confusing was the lower F efficacy in HIV positive patients in South Africa. J and J didn't seem to report anything like that. Can you walk us through the why behind that? Well, we, you know, we don't really know. It's the why is probably just because it's small numbers. Now, we had 4,500 people in the, in the global trial, and, and uh, only 150 were recorded in the, in the HIV trial. We had six cases. We had four cases. It turns out we had four cases in the vaccine group and two cases in the placebo group. And, and you know, one number changes would have changed things from negative efficacy to plus efficacy efficacy so it, it, nobody puts any um, substance to to that particular result the result that we got was a 92 percent of the patients of the subjects was a 60 percent efficacy so so it, as we as we collect more data and finish uh, collecting over time we may sort that out but but it's not clear Stan are you already long, working long, on a numbers. on a reform Sorry, are you already working on a reformulated version to, to deal with some of these these mutations? We are. Our technology is 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 very flexible and allows us to do that. All we're doing is we're making a re, making a protein. We're making a re recombinant protein that forms fo folds into a particle and and formulating it with an adjuvant, which is a very important safe immune stimulant. And, and uh, we made the one we're using to match what has been circulating for the last year. And as you can see, it works very well with 96% efficacy. 
Um, when it mutates a little bit, you know, we may lose a little bit of efficacy and when it mutates more, uh, then we may have to decide to make it a new strain. So we can make that strain and sub we would have two choices. One is we can substitute uh, the new strain for the old strain and just turn the manufacturing process back on. It's not very difficult to do that. Or, or uh, alternatively, and this may be the preferred method, is to have a bivalent vaccine like we do with flu. Mm -hmm. In flu, we have four strains uh, to, to address exactly the problem that we're seeing in coronavirus right now. And so the coronavirus may turn into very similar to a flu, flu issue. Stan, this might feel a little wonky, but um, can the vaccines get distributed enough to stop more mutations, or will the virus mutate faster than vaccines can get out? And what's an implication for that? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a good question that I don't think anybody knows the answer to yet. It's, it's uh, we try to make, we all work to make, let go back to the flu. It, we started flu with, you know, a couple, bivalent and trivalent and a decade ago, we switched to quad, uh, quadrivalent. Uh, we can do that with COVID and, uh, um, and we just don't, we just have to wait and see. It's not known. Alex and I have talked to a, a bunch of uh, CEOs that are doing what you're doing uh, over the last few days, Stan. Uh, and one of the things that has stood out from those conversations is there is an expectation that this is going to become like the flu, that we will be maybe even combining COVID-19 vaccines with the flu vaccine, the flu shot that we all get every year. Do you see that as being likely as well? We, don't, we not only see it as being likely, we're working on it. We, we, so our company is vaccines only and we happen to be experts at respiratory vaccines we make a flu vaccine that we just nine months ago we we unblinded a uh, a pivotal phase three flu trial uh, uh, going head to head against the best-selling flu vaccine and we showed that our vaccine works better it, it, it creates a broader protection immune response because of because of the technology of the adjuvant and the, and the nanoparticle we, we expect it to do the same for coronavirus and we can combine coronavirus flu and we also have an rsv vaccine so the three major causes of respiratory illness in a seasonal basis uh we think we can have a great uh combination vaccine uh some of the news today uh was the european union's export ban uh, on vaccines how does that affect you what do you think about that it seems like a vaccine nationalism front and center it it is what we worried about a year ago and that's why we established eight different manufacturing facilities and partnerships in seven different countries. We're in India, we're in Europe, we're in the US and we're in Asia. And so uh, there's a lot of flexibility with what we do. Stan, have you gone back over your contracts as a result of the trouble that AstraZeneca is have, having? Have we gone back over our contracts? Contracts? Like, have you looked at your contract with the EU? Like, how does it? How, how does what is happening with AstraZeneca and the problems yeah. that it's having uh, with the EU in terms of who gets who gets the, the the shots first? Have you looked at your contracts? Have you looked at the language within them? Are you confident that you're okay? Well, we will be. We have not signed a contract with the EU yet. We're negotiating okay. a contract with the EU. Um, has, do you think you will change the way you approach that contract as a result we'll, of what's we'll, happening we'll pay with, a lot of, with yes, Astra? Yes, we will pay a lot of attention to what's going on right now, um, and make sure that you know we want to be we want to be as transparent as possible about what our production uh, forecast is going to be, and and you, and things happen, and and so we also have to have it in the contracts that if there are delays, then then we'll we'll make uh, uh, provisions for that. So how does that how does that work? I mean, if you have a delay in one plant, and it doesn't have to be in Europe, but any plant, if you have a delay in one plant, um, do you then have to recalibrate like where you're sending what vaccine? Like we've never had to deal with something like this before. So how do you choose when there's a delay? Uh, you're right, we haven't, and and uh, that's that's something that we are look you know looking to we're looking to try to have enough capacity. That we can that we have flexibility to if we miss a, you know miss making a batch in one particular plant we can we can provide product from another it's it's not trivial because there are a lot of regulatory issues mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's 
if you get regulatory approval in Europe for a particular plant, you can't automatically switch a product from India to Europe, for instance. So it's, it's complicated. Stan, if we, if we delay certain regions in providing vaccines for them, what is the risk there? Um, Israel's miles ahead. The UK is doing OK. Europe is behind. There are parts of the emerging markets that, that really haven't had any major vaccination programs underway at this point. How does, how does that staggered rollout, do you think, will affect the way that this pandemic is going to progress? Well, you know, this is why we have the strategy that we do and, and we form partnerships with people. We, we believe that that uh, the best way to solve the pandemic issue is to have global production and distribution of our vaccine. And that's why we partnered with the Serum Institute, for instance, of India. And they have promised to make, you know, we have the capacity without serum of making about a billion doses. They have the capacity to make a billion plus doses. They are expert, the world's expert in distributing vaccines in the 92 low income countries. So we can't, we didn't know how. And so we partnered with them. And so they will, they will work with Gavi, for instance, which is the Global Alliance for Vaccines uh, to distribute and get registered, uh, you know, a billion doses for low and middle income countries. And we'll, we'll take the opposite part of the population and, and we'll work together to get the vaccine at the same time um, because this is, this is not a, it's not a U.S. problem. Solving the U.S. problem is not going to solve the pandemic issue. It's got to be everywhere. And so that's what we're working to do. Yeah, that's no the, no kidding. Um, speaking of emerging markets, um, uh, I just wanted to get your take on, do you have any data on the Brazil variant and no, the reaction don't. to the vaccine and how that might affect the U.S. trial since we now have that variant here? Right. We don't. Uh, obviously, to the extent that those uh, people in the trial have the Brazilian variant, we'll, we'll get data on that. But we don't now have uh, data on that. So what we have, uh, I think we're pretty remarkable that we're the first company to have efficacy data against three uh, circulating strains, mm -hmm. but, we, but, but we don't have uh, uh, Brazil yet.